Hey Austin Christian family, my name is Josh Vett and I am so excited to get a chance to tag in on this awesome series we've got going here on one another relationships. And so tonight we're going to be talking about one of the more uncomfortable parts of one another relationships, but it's still extremely important. And it's a concept of confessing sin. And you'll either respond in two different ways to confessing sin. Either, oh, yes, amen, I've got some things to share. Or, ooh, <laughs> I don't enjoy confessing sin. You might respond in either of those ways because it is an awkward thing sometimes. You know, someone named John Lee wrote, Confessing sin is always awkward, sometimes costly, and absolutely worth it. And I feel like that entails what confessing sin is. That, hey... It is uncomfortable, but guys, stick with me. Stick with the scriptures here tonight. It is vital to our relationships with God and in our relationships with one another. And so do you guys remember what it felt like to be a new disciple? When you were studying the Bible, when you were finally being open about the gunk in your heart, and, and we just, oh my goodness, we felt so free when we first became a disciple and got baptized. And that's my favorite thing seeing a new disciple and seeing how transformed they feel and, and how their life is. I mean, you go ask a, a new disciple what their story is and they are like, oh, I'm ready. This is where my life was and this is who I am now. You know, there's no shame. They're, they're an open book. But something happens to us five years, 10 years, 15 years as a disciple. We lose a little bit of that if we're not careful. You know, if we're not careful, we find ourselves starting to fight battles on our own. But the thing is, when we become a disciple, we're not immune to sin. It's the most devastating realization when you're a new disciple and you sin again. And you're like, no, you know, it's heartbreaking. But we realize, hey, we're still imperfect human beings striving to follow a perfect God. But something happens where we lose this ability to be an open book if we're not careful. Maybe we're playing mental gymnastics thinking things like, well, I don't know what people would think of me if they knew I was still struggling with this sin this many years later as a disciple. Maybe we're thinking, I don't want to be a burden. Uh, newer disciples need, need the focus. I'll just, I'll fight this on my own. Maybe we're thinking, well, hey, I get open with God when I sin and I pray about it, but I don't need to drag others into my issues. You know, what mental gymnastics are you doing to avoid the simple truth that we can't do this on our own? That God designed this because he knew we need one another. And we get this from, from the scriptures in John, 1 John 1, 5. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness... We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. It's laid out clearly before us here that God is light and we need to stay in the light with him. And to stay in the light, we don't have to be perfect. That's not what it's saying. To stay in the light, we have to stay open. We have to do everything we can to cast out the darkness when it takes that inch on us, when it gets inside. We've got to confess to one another and we will be forgiven. We will be cleansed of all unrighteousness when we confess to one another because it's gross what lurks in the darkness. You know, I'm so grateful to be here in Austin, everyone. I, I just moved here like two months ago, um, but I have to be honest, it was really hard moving in here at first. This is a brand new apartment. I'm living with some of the brothers and uh, very grateful for them. But uh, a few weeks into living here, I was grabbing a, a, you know, a glass of water middle of the night, just walking down the dark hallway, Turn the light on in the kitchen, and I saw eight, nine, ten, I don't even know how many cockroaches scurry across my floor. And I went, oh no, oh no, I don't want to do that. A week later, I'm, I'm doing the same thing, going to grab a glass of water, and I'm walking down the dark hallway, can't see a thing, 
and I feel a crunch under my foot and I go, oh, I didn't have shoes on. I didn't want to turn on the light. <laughs> I did not want to see what I just stepped on. It's gross what lurks in the darkness. But when we hit that light switch, it reveals what's really there. And it's gross, but at least I know what's there on the floor. I can't fight roaches in the dark. And so anyways, you know, long story short, uh, got, got help. So grateful for Brian Tan. Uh, we couldn't call in the exterminators uh, for our apartment because our apartment does include that, but they all have COVID or they were tested COVID positive and so they couldn't come in. So it's either COVID or the roaches. And so I was like, well, shoot, I guess we're gonna, we're gonna have to take the roaches. Um, and so Brian Tan helped me out and gave me some great, uh, great equipment. And I, I actually think I became a part-time exterminator. Um, but I gotta tell you, it changed the way that I perceive roaches. It changed how in tune I am with movement in this apartment. Once we turned on that light switch and started fighting these roaches, oh my goodness, if I see the slightest movement in the corner of this apartment, my eyes don't ignore it. I go, whoa, and I laser sight on what just moved. And if it's a roach, I'm gonna kill it and I'm gonna deal with it because I'm fed up with roaches. And that's just because we finally turned on the light and figured out what was, what was lurking in the dark. And I know it's just roaches here, but it's the same with our sin. No one would let roaches just scurry in the corner of their house and go, eh, they'll probably leave on their own. No, we're going to fight that thing. It's same with sin, that what is lurking in our hearts needs to have light shown on it. we got to figure out what's lurking, what's the gunk in our hearts. And once we're open about it, we're in tune with it. And not only are you in tune with it, but now Brian's asking me week to week, hey, any roaches, any roaches? Because I finally shed some light on the situation. What are the roaches in your heart that you need, you need to call in some help, that you need to turn on the lights for? Because you can't fight this on your own. You can't fight in the dark. You know, I just got, a, I just got out of college with a degree in communications at UTSA, and uh, we learned a lot about the importance of connection and being with one another, that we can't do this thing of life on our own, not even in a spiritual way, just biologically, we, we, need, we need one another. And there was a, a study done on rats. And uh, here's a quick picture of a rat, if you forgot what a rat looks like. Ugh, little vermin. And they did a study on a rat and put it in a cage. And in this cage, it was by itself with nothing to do. There was just two bowls in front of it. One bowl of water and one bowl of heroin and cocaine and a bunch of mixture of drugs. And every single rat that they put in this situation, every single rat died of overdosing on the drugs. They went straight for the drugs and ignored the water. But years later, they redid this experiment, but placed a rat in what they called the rat park. They set up a nice little, uh, you know, little complexes of slides and balls and colorful things and cheese, and they put rats all together in this cage. So without a rat being by itself, now there's two, three, four, five rats that are all hanging out and being friends together. You know, I mean, it's, it's a rat party, but still there was a bowl of water and a bowl of a mixture of drugs. But with the rats that had each other and things to fill their time with, not a single one overdosed. And what they showed is the power of connection. That when a rat was isolated and by itself, it gave in. But when it had other rats, it, it completely resisted the temptation of heroin and cocaine. Church, if a rat can resist the temptation to indulge because it has its friends and family, we've got to be better than rats. If you, if you walk away with anything from tonight's discussion, we've got to be better than rats. We can't do this on our own. Don't separate yourself from the pack. Do you remember what happens to animals that separate themselves from the pack? They get devoured. They get targeted. Spiritually, we get targeted by Satan when we separate ourselves from the pack. So take tonight. Take tonight to be open. It's a bit of a shorter lesson here so that you can enjoy being open and confessing to one another in our, in our discussion groups tonight. I have a few questions here um, before, obviously we're gonna take time to be open, but before we even get into that, answer the question, how have you handled the confession of others? 
You know, this is very important. I think uh, we can kind of get in a rhythm of someone confesses to us, especially in a group setting, and we just go, hmm, thanks for sharing. And then we kind of move on. How have you handled the confession of others? On, on the flip side, have you been uh, one to condemn someone for confessing when they're trying to be humble and get help? You know, how have you handled it? We got to make sure we're responding to people when they're confessing and asking for help in a righteous way and in a way that Jesus would respond when we've confessed. Is there anything you need to be open about tonight? Take this time to be open. And how would you categorize yourself? Uh, there's, you know, out of these four, do you rarely confess sin? Do you confess only when there's big sin? Or do you consistently confess sin? And are you open even about temptations? So kind of those four tiers, those four levels, where do you find yourself in honestly tonight? And why do you think you're that way? And are there any changes you want to make to that? Again, church, confessing sin is awkward. It can be costly. It's a risk, but it's always worth it. Thank you. Love you guys. Have a great discussion tonight.